Cool. Uh, my name is Roland Kuhn. I'm leading the ACAP project at TypeSafe. Uh, and today, uh, I will actually talk a little bit about ACA uh, towards the end of the talk. Uh, yesterday, I talked a lot, of, a lot about reactive programming. And uh, today is going to be about uh, what that means for streams. Uh, Brian Goetz uh, introduced uh, in the keynote quite nicely um, the necessity and motivated all uh, why we would be interested in handling streams. And that is the high level functional, the way you, you as a programmer think about kind of perspective. What we'll be looking he at here is more like the machinery we need to make this work in a reactive application so that it does not destroy the nice reactive properties that we want to have. First of all, uh, we need to look at what is a stream. Let's, let's quickly uh, dive into that. Uh, a stream is an ephemeral flow of data elements, data items, uh, which you process and you focus during the processing on the transformation of these data items. So a, a stream uh, is something which, which flows. It's like the natural uh, metaphor. It's quite fitting. Water which has flown down the stream is, is gone, right? Um, a stream has also interesting properties in that it can be unbounded in size. It's not like a list of five elements. Uh, it could be, for example, um, a, a ticker from a, st a stock exchange. Uh, and if you take that together, uh, as long as the, the stock exchange exists, there will be new uh, items in this stream. Uh, and that highlights another property. Uh, a stream can also contain elements which were not known up front. When you construct the stream, you don't need to know uh, what kind of data items it will contain. They can be computed or become known uh, at later points in time. Now, if we look at common use cases for streams, um, you probably, the first thing you think about, uh, because you probably do that uh, in the evenings, is video streaming. You view some, some videos from Netflix, for example, and the way these data get from the, the service to your computer is via a streaming mechanism. And this streaming mechanism needs to be built in such a way that the data arrive when they are needed, and, uh, but, but you can't just send them too quickly. Uh, so they need to be properly uh, scheduled to arrive just at the right rate through the network. Um, there are other kinds of bulk data transfers. Uh, for example, if you want to upload uh, big uh, data items to S3 buckets, for example, you will need to stream them up there or you want to, uh, to synchronize things. So bulk data transfers are one uh, example of where we want to use streaming, where we want to transfer data in this, in this fashion. Uh, Real-time data sources, uh, I mentioned one example, this uh, stock price ticker. But you can also look at, um, for example, sensor data which comes in, measurements which are sampled like every second, and then you have a stream of these data. One very interesting perspective, which uh, Dean will talk about later, I think, uh, is that streams also play a big role in processing very large data sets. These data sets are known up front, and the problem is just that they are too big. And the way you describe the reduction and, what, and transformation of these data sets is remarkably similar to what we have seen this morning in how streams are described. This, is, this means that there is a natural um, opportunity um, to use streaming in processing big data sets. The last point um, is quite similar to, to the real-time data sources, but it uh, deserves mention that it is very useful to extract metrics uh, from running systems. We all know that. And that will only become more important uh, the more we go into distributed systems. We've heard that yesterday also in other talks. Um, you will need to keep your uh, data flowing in about how your system, the different parts of your system behave in order to understand the overall behavior and to find bugs and, and uh, uh, glitches and identi identify these sources of errors and correct them. So uh, handling the monitoring data which come out of your system, that's also a kind of stream which you might want to process. These kinds of data um, and the transformations uh, that is all nice, uh, nicely uh, written down using these, for example, Java 8 lambdas and so on. Uh, but what 
what was the specific problem that sparked the Reactive Streams project? So what is so special about Reactive Streams? Yesterday, um, you might have seen, if you were in my presentation, this, this picture again, uh, uh, already. Um, the four reactive traits, as laid out by the Reactive Manifesto. And uh, uh, the argument is that you want your application or service or whatever it is that you provide, to have certain desirable properties. And at the top we have responsiveness, which means that the service is only useful if it responds in a timely manner. And in order to achieve that, uh, it needs to stay uh, responsive uh, even in the face of failure, which means that we need to make it resilient. And uh, it also needs to stay responsive uh, in the face of changing load. So when more users hit your system, uh, you want to keep uh, the, the responses coming and not like, have the system fail under high load. And if you uh, break these down a little bit, um, what, we, what we see is that for resilience, we need to compartmentalize our application into different pieces. We, so we don't put all eggs in one basket. We need different baskets to put the eggs in. And then we need to isolate them from each other. Once you have done that, then, well, these baskets, they will need to uh, communicate somehow. They will need to collaborate. Otherwise, it wouldn't have made sense to put them in there. Uh, and the way these, uh, com this communication works is uh, naturally asynchronous. So you will need to send data from here to there. And these are executed, for example, on different machines. And uh, the data need to go uh, and be processed in an asynchronous fashion. The same goes for scalability. If you cannot uh, handle the load you need to handle on a single system, then you will have to uh, distribute it. And for a while you can scale up across multiple nodes, uh, multiple cores in your, in your machine, buying a, a bigger and bigger and bigger one. Uh, but at some point that hits the limit of what you can buy. And then, at, well, uh, maybe before, but, but that is the last point when you need to switch to scaling out. And uh, that again means that uh, if you want to exchange data between the different parts uh, into which you have split up your application to make it scale, uh, they will need to cross uh, asynchronous boundaries. This means that in, in a reactive application, there are several kinds of asynchronous boundaries and they will play a crucial role uh, in, in the um, motivation behind reactive streams. But let's first enumerate a few of those. Um, there is one uh, very obvious one. Uh, if you have split up your overall problem into multiple different applications, which is quite common. You have internal services which uh, are then tied together by some front-end application, for example, um, which means that you have data crossing the boundary between different applications. This means uh, that uh, the stream which crosses this boundary will need to be uh, capable of, of doing that in, in, in the right fashion. Obviously, once you have uh, things operating on different network nodes, you have the network which needs to be traversed, which is an async boundary. But also, uh, we are beginning to see that uh, having an explicit network card and switches and so on is not the only way to get a distributed system. When we're talking about uh, really high performance uh, considerations, we need to think of a, a, a single machine with multiple CPU sockets as a distributed system because it takes a lot of time to get data from, from this socket here to that socket over there, over the QPI link, for example. Um, so this means that uh, we will see uh, that we need to treat data transfers within the same, uh, on the same main board, uh, in some cases, as uh, remote data transfers. Then when we, we, we transfer data between different threads, obviously we need to put them through some, some sort of queue, but we can break that down in the case of ACA even further. Um, if you want to send data between different actors, they could share the same thread, but you still have the problem that, and we have seen that on the mailing list, that was our motivation uh, to be part of this reactive uh, streams project. When you send from actor A to actor B, which is a completely push only, I, I just send messages uh, 
uh, fashion of sending things, uh, then it's quite hard to build in back pressure. We will see that that's the crucial thing. Uh, what we've seen that the recipient actor, if it was not fast enough, would have its mailbox growing and growing and growing until the system goes out of memory. So that was basically the main problem. The main problem behind reactive streams and the, main, the, the one problem that we really want to solve with this project is a very narrow one, very specific one, namely how to get data across an async boundary without all the pain. So let's look at some, some possible solutions. The first one, let's call it the traditional way. When we uh, put something into a queue to have it consumed by another thread to simplify it, uh, we would use a blocking queue. We would give it a bounded size so that it doesn't give us an out of memory exception. And then when you try to put something in and the queue happens to be full, well, the one who tries to put something in will be blocked. The thread will go to sleep and it will not be able to do anything useful anymore until the queue uh, is drained by, by the receiver. This is a very direct couple, uh, coupling between sender and recipient of the data. Because when the recipient, for example, fails and is unable to proceed, then the sender will be blocked as well, potentially infinitely. When, when that one failed, uh, it will never pull anything out of the collection of elements in this queue. So uh, this has lots of problems and therefore uh, we don't really want that. So then there is a second way of doing things um, where we want, we want to avoid this coupling. So the best way to avoid coupling is to remove communication. For the synchronous queue example, we had too much communication going on. The recipient could tell the, the sender to completely stop doing things and, and could, could hold it hostage. And uh, this can be avoided by a push model. This is uh, what the reactive extensions for .NET and, and also RxJava are doing. Um, it's, it's a purely push way of doing things. And it's fundamentally also what actors are doing. So again, this is uh, why, why we found each other uh, to form this project. Uh, the problem with the push way, as I have alluded to earlier, is that when the producer of data is faster than the consumer, you have two options actually three, and most people choose the worst. So uh, the first option is to buffer until, up, uh, uh, up to a limit, uh, and then uh, start dropping things. And the, sec the second option is, no, I, off by one arrows are really hard, right? Uh, so the second one is to not foresee the bound, and then you get the out of memory error. So you didn't think about the problem at first. So this is, this is where, where the problems uh, came into the picture, and this is also why we don't like that. Uh, and therefore, we just make up a new term, that's how things work nowadays, we just call it reactive, and then we make a wish list. We want it to be completely non-blocking, we want uh, that not, no party can, can hold the other hostage uh, in, in the way that it cannot react anymore. Uh, but we still want to keep the system bounded. We want to not have the problem of out-of-memory errors. This is, sounds like the perfect thing, and it sounds like almost magical. So how do we do that? Well, there is a system which does something which is very similar, and you will probably recognize it if you look beyond the names and, and things. Uh, it's called TCP, and it does it since decades. Uh, you send data from one system to another, and there is a back channel, these acknowledgements, and there is a window size which is managed. So TCP has managed to, make, to, to solve the problem where the sender is faster than the consumer. Well, the sender will not be able to send anything when the window size has been used up. And this is the basic idea also for reactive streams. It's basically matching up supply and demand. Supply is that push model, we, we push the data, but uh, the modification here is that we can only push the data when there is demand. So data items flow downstream in the pipe, and demand flows opposite, flows upstream. And the data items can only flow 
when there actually is demand. What this does is that the recipient is in full control over the rate of data items which uh, it will receive because the one producing the, or publishing these data items uh, will not do so at a higher rate which, as that which is allowed by the demand that is fully controlled by the subscriber. And that also means that the subscriber can control the amount of buffering it is willing to do. If the subscriber says, I, demand, I have a demand of 10 items, then it only needs to have a buffer for 10 because the publisher by contract cannot send more than 10. There is one uh, astonishing um, thing. I, I, I find it a very astonishing that this very simple scheme uh, has this property of being what I call a dynamic push-pull model. As long as the subscriber is fast enough or faster than the, uh, the, the publisher, there will always be demand flowing from right to left, um, but there will always be, so this one signals more demand than, the, than that one can, can satisfy, so uh, the publisher will always have some demand left. It can always send. It will never be uh, 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 hindered in any way. So as soon as the data items become available, the publisher can just send them. It's a pure push model as long as the subscriber is faster than the publisher. If the subscriber is slower than the publisher, then this turns into a pull model because the publisher will have to wait for the demand until it can send things. So you, can, you can view it from the other way. The subscriber demands items and gets them in return. So it's a pure pull model in this case. And the astonishing um, uh, thing which happens is that it's adaptive. It switches between the two um, at runtime as need arises. Another nice property uh, which we were um, also looking for, uh, since we're uh, aware of the mechanical sympathy work uh, done by the guys at uh, LMAX and uh, Martin Thompson and so on. We always wanted to foresee that uh, an implementation of this scheme could be highly efficient also on the hardware level. And a, w a way to do that, uh, or a necess necessary prerequisite, I would say, is that you allow smart batching. Batching means that um, a CPU really enjoys doing the same thing over and over and over again. The CPU does not really like switching tasks because that, you know, the caches will not have the right contents and so on. So it, it likes doing repetitive tasks. That was, that's what these CPUs are designed for. And if you bundle your demand to be like in units, like, like thousand elements at a, at a time, then the publisher can just generate or process the next 1,000 elements and put them Onto the, send them to the subscriber. So processing at the publisher will be quite efficient because it can keep doing the same thing uh, until the demand runs out. And then the subscriber will also get these elements in quick succession and, and we can hopefully leverage uh, the same advantage at that side. There is another uh, very nice thing about this scheme which is not commonly seen uh, if you look at TCP. I mentioned that as an example. Uh, TCP implementations do not give you explicitly access to the demand flow because that's all handled by the kernel. Uh, but in reactive streams, um, demand and data are basically just the same thing. It's just that demand is always integers while data can be anything you might want to send around. In this, uh, in this example here, uh, we have one processing entity where the stream comes in from the left. So the data flow from left to right. And uh, this thing outputs two streams. It could broadcast, so just um, send the same elements to both sides, or it could be a filter where the true goes to the top and the false goes to the bottom, it doesn't really matter. Um, the important part to note is that the demand which is flowing back from the two um, subscribers on the right-hand side can be merged explicitly here at this point. And this merging strategy can be chosen to be appropriate for the operation you want to have. 
So uh, if you broadcast, then of course both need to have demand in order to, to be able to send something. Uh, you could also have a load balancing scheme where you say, oh, I'll send to, the, to, to that one which has signaled most demand first. Um, you, you can implement uh, whatever you want. The, the, the nice thing is that making the demand propagation explicit in this scheme allows exactly this flexibility. And uh, I think we will see implementations make great, great use of that. Uh, one uh, nice thing about this symmetry I, I alluded to is when I flip this graph around, quite simply, um, then, uh, well, splitting a data stream becomes merging a data stream, and merging the demand stream becomes uh, splitting the demand stream. So, uh, really, it is just two streams going in opposite directions where one is just integers. That's a nice way to look at it. So, in summary, reactive streams are about crossing an asynchronous boundary in a fashion which does not break uh, any of the nice properties. So we want asynchronous non-blocking data flow going downstream. We want asynchronous non-blocking demand flow going upstream. And we want to minimize uh, coordination and, co and contention between the components to make them uh, execute efficiently uh, on a large multi-core machine, for example. And uh, we want to uh, design the APIs in such a way that we can use pure message passing for these. So data items flowing, flowing downstream don't need any direct feedback. It's just a message which flows downstream. The response is another, another message, which is the demand flowing upstream. So the, the, the API should be, uh, or SPI in that case, uh, should be written in such a way um, that it allows these fire and forget um, messaging styles of communication. And if we do that, then we can use reactive streams to cross any kind of uh, asynchronous boundary because we don't need to return synchronous results. So we can easily cross uh, network nodes or, or applications uh, with them. Before I go into the real practical aspects uh, of showing the code, um, there is one thing which, which I would like to discuss first because uh, I've seen that mentioned and uh, when we discussed this uh, while implementing and designing and, and playing with the ideas, we found um, that the question is, is really interesting uh, whether streams are collections or not. So for that, let's first look at what a collection is. That is a more difficult task than I expected. I expected, yeah, I will find a paper or Wikipedia page which tells me uh, what, the, what the collection is. Uh, I also asked, asked Martin Odersky for our resident guru on, on all things uh, computer science and the answer was also not so cl crystal clear. So um, it, seems to, yeah, it seems to be a soft term. If I look in the dictionary, uh, Oxford Dictionary tells me a collection is a group of things or people. Let that uh, settle in your mind a bit. We are, we are a collection, we are a group of people here, right? Then, if I look at the Wikipedia page for collection in uh, computer science, uh, it says it's a grouping of some variable number of data items. So if we were data items, we would still be a collection. Uh, apart from that, it's, it's still the same kind of mental image, that it is a grouping of concrete things then I, I just typed it into Google and I didn't really find many, many sources, so I include here also one from the Backbone JS documentation that collections are simply an ordered set of mo uh, models, which is, again, the same thing. Uh, and finally, uh, the authoritative uh, source here should be what is Java Util Collection. If we look at it, I mean, that's the, the platform on which most of us work, uh, and, well, that, that defines a certain thing. Uh, and that has a size method which returns an integer. So a collection is something which has a finite and well-defined size which you can get. Uh, it also provides an iterator, which means that you can um, enumerate all the elements which are in the collection. And it has a contains method, so you can query the collection for membership of a certain data item. Programming with collections is something we do every day. 
and uh, we have certain expectations when it comes to collections. Namely, when we use an iterator to iterate over a collection, we expect it to visit all elements. There are some caveats, uh, like if you use a normal collection and you modify it concurrently, you, you, you will get garbage. But that's probably what, what you deserve. Um, <laughs> Uh, if, if you use a concurrent collection, then iterators have very special properties which are documented. So th there are expectations what an iterator does. Um, the second one is if, if I have a list, let's say, which, which is called X, and I split it up into the head and the tail, and then I concatenate them, so putting the head in front of the tail again, I expect to get the same list. I mean, it should at least be, it should compare equal uh, to the list I had to begin with. Um, many people would be surprised if that would not be the case. Also, when we look at a collection and we process it, um, we are used to that it does not depend on who does the processing. So if I, if I look at an array list and, and I iterate over it and I sum things up, uh, it shouldn't matter where, whether, whether I do it in this method or in that method or on that computer. Um, it should always do the same thing. Uh, the same uh, thing is that we don't expect uh, differences to occur just because the processing happens at a different point in time. Now, keep those in mind when we look at streams, because streams have some unexpected properties. The observed sequence of data items which you have in a certain uh, processing stage, this sequence uh, is can be put into a collection, of course, uh, but it has the properties uh, which are, these properties which are unexpected for a real collection. Because uh, if the uh, observer subscribes to the stream after the stream has started running, like in Rx, you can do that, uh, you will not see the first elements unless you took care to have them repeated by the source and so on. So uh, it depends on when you do the processing. Um, also, as we talked about, uh, sender and receiver of data uh, can, can have different speeds. So if, if, the, if the recipient is too slow, uh, someone upstream might just drop data because if the, the source cannot be throttled like uh, stock tickers, they just come every 10 milliseconds, no matter whether you can keep up or not. And if you cannot keep up, then you will miss updates. So in that sense, the stream of stock tickers, stock ticker items, uh, is not really a collection because you, an iterator over it will not see all elements. Um, and the opposite is also a, a very interesting one. Uh, if you query something once a second, so you need an update every second, but the data source might not actually provide one with streams that is no, no issue at all. Uh, Rx, again, uh, has that as well, um, that you have uh, something which takes the, the original stream and makes it queryable at any point in time. So it will just fabricate values, like give you the, the last known value for a while. Um, so you might, might actually see more data items in your stream than the source actually emitted. And these are all unexpected if you think that streams are collections. And therefore my conclusion is, and everybody should be very clear about this, that streams are not collections. Uh, it is very helpful, uh, I think, and instructive to read the package documentation for Java Util Stream because uh, that uh, seems to agree with me there in that Stream, the, the interface, does not derive from collection. That's the first one. And also, uh, if you read it through, uh, I think, the end of the first um, paragraph, streams differ from collections in several ways. And then they enumerate uh, precisely what these ways are. Um, the first one is the stream is ephemeral, so there is no data storage attached while it is flowing through. Uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't keep the whole thing uh, in memory. Um, it is functional in nature and focusing on the transformation which you apply instead of uh, the data set itself. Um, Java Util stream is explicitly laziness seeking as um, Brian has um, explained this morning in that you can write down all these steps of, of map and filter and so on, and nothing will actually be done until you uh, do this terminal action, uh, and then operations will be fused and so on. So uh, there's not, not more work done uh, than, than absolutely needed, 
which is different for collections. Uh, if you take a collection, your map filter and so on, you create a new one at each intermediate step. Streams can be possibly unbounded, which Java collections cannot. And uh, an important one is, that, that was the ephemeral part as well, streams are consumable. So when a stream has run, then it has run. If you want to have uh, a stream from the same source again, for example, uh, you will have to create a new stream. The, the, the old one has run out. So to expand on that one, you can certainly create a stream from a collection. You can have a collection be the source for a stream, but the collection and the stream will not be the same thing. And obviously, along the, along the way of processing the stream, at each step, you can take all the elements you see, the data items, and put them in a list, uh, so you can turn a stream into a collection. But again, the stream and the collection are different things. I, I expand on this point so much because we should be very clear before uh, people get, get hurt um, that saying that stream is just a lazy collection will not have the right effect on the programs people are going to write. So streams are really live objects. So uh, with that uh, side remark, uh, we, can, we can look into some, some choices which we uh, evaluated before actually doing our own because uh, it's much more efficient if the solve, uh, problem has already, already been solved by someone. So there was this uh, JDK 8, Java Util Stream, stream, and uh, of course, that's, that's a very nice thing. Uh, I can show you an example here. Uh, I just uh, import the whole, the whole package thing. I make a stream out of the values one, two, and three, and then uh, we can map it by prepending uh, the stream A to all the elements. So we have the stream A1, A2, A3 at this point. And then I can, de can do either of these. Um, so the Java streams are really consumable in the sense that you cannot even reuse the definition of this stream here. So I can say iterator, which will give me a normal iterator. And uh, I can then pull items out of the stream. This is a, a way of, of uh, um, consuming the, the result, which is completely pull-based. Or I can have a completely push-based way of consuming with the terminal actions, like uh, max was shown and sum uh, for each uh, is another one. So I could say for each of these elements, I just print them out. Um, this, this is certainly a nice thing, and I think it will play a big role in how we work, especially with collections uh, in Java 8. Uh, it provides a DSL which focuses on transformation, which was something that was missing from JDK. And Brian is completely right that that will be the way uh, of leading developers along the path of least resistance, nice code, and functional, right? Just don't say the M word. And uh, the interesting part here is, coming, uh, talking about the M word, this introduces uh, staged computation. So you write down what you want to happen at some later point, and then at, when you're done describing what you want to happen, you pull the trigger, kind of with this terminal action like for each. Uh, well, uh, I put in brackets here, it does not allow reuse. Uh, you will see a, a different example later. Uh, the problem with Java 8 streams is that they focus on the things Brian has elaborated. Uh, they do not focus um, that much uh, on, the, on the reactive um, properties of the actual mechanics of running it along different um, processing pipeline steps which might be executed in parallel, crossing asynchronous boundaries along the way, because um, it has an eager model of execution. That was here, uh, this um, for each method. The for each method will un only uh, uh, return once the full stream has been printed. It's a bit surprising, I, I find. And um, I, I hear uh, that they might be working on something to, ha to have asynchronous versions of that in a later, later uh, JDK, but that is not yet there. Uh, the other problem is um, we talked about this dynamic push-pull, which is really nice because then you don't need to know beforehand uh, which component will be faster at runtime. Um, for Java 8 streams, you need to decide upfront whether you want to do a pull using this iterator thing uh, or, or push and you need to choose that, yeah, up front, as I said. 
Well, there is another project which is uh, good for handling streams, and I talked about that, uh, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, that's uh, RxJava in our case. That's uh, the Netflix clone of the reactive extensions which were developed for .NET. So how does that same thing, or very similar thing with the B instead of an A, uh, how does that look like in RxJava? Here, streams are called observable, and here I make a range from one to three. Uh, you can map them, transform them. Uh, in RxJava, you can actually subscribe multiple times to the same stream definition. It will just create then two streams which run. The first one will just uh, print all the values. The second one has an additional filter that it only prints B2 in effect. This uh, implements, as I said, a pure push model. Um, is a very nice way of, of describing streams with a very powerful and extensive DSL uh, for all the transformations which you might want to apply, uh, including multi-stream handling, zipping, merging, splitting, and all these combinators. Uh, everything is in there. Um, the only flaw is that it allows only one scheme for back pressure, and that is a, scream, a, a scheme which only works locally, and that is by blocking the caller. What, what happens in effect is you have an observable and uh, what is attached underneath, which you don't see in, in, when you use these um, combinators, is an observer and the observer has an onNext method. And the observable just calls onNext all the time whenever it has a value. And the only way for the observer to defend itself against uh, uh, being pushed data at a too fast pace is by not returning from onNext, by, by blocking the caller. And uh, yeah, that, that was precisely what we wanted to fix. Um, the, the scheme which is currently in RxJava uh, uses the unbounded buffering technique. So you can uh, have a stream continue on a different thread pool. And well, if your consumer is slower than your producer, you get out of memory errors. Uh, which is precisely why we started talking. Um, ben from, from Netflix and, and Victor and I uh, and a few others, uh, Tim is in the audience, uh, in the audience as, as well from Vertex, and um, uh, um, Norman Maurer, John Brisbane um, from, from Pivotal, and a few others. And it turned out um, that this, this basic problem was really one which everyone had seen in different, slightly different variations. So we started working on the Reactive Streams project. Um, the collaboration uh, includes, as I said, uh, engineers from different uh, companies. Um, we have uh, Ben from Netflix, Marius from, from Twitter, um, from, from Red Hat it's uh, Norman and uh, Tim, uh, from Pivotal it's um, John and, and Stefan Maldini, and from TypeSafe uh, a, few, a few people uh, besides myself as well, uh, and a few others. So um, this, this has been uh, uh, collaborative effort of many very, very different uh, um, people and uh, people uh, with very different viewpoints, uh, which, you can, which you can witness if you, at, at the end I'll, I'll show you links to the GitHub repositories and so on, the discussions. It, it's really interesting seeing how many different people look at this problem from a very different angle and uh, it, I think it was very beneficial for this project to have all of them uh, uh, participate so that we get the, the best solution for everyone. The idea is, as I said, that we all had the same problem. We all want to build tools for our communities uh, which solve the hard problem um, so that the users don't have to deal with it anymore. And the, the common solution would benefit everybody because if we figure it out once, we should be able to, to just reuse it. But that is not enough um, it, because if, ever, if everyone just uses the same principle, um, then we, we would be missing out on one opportunity, namely uh, interoperability. So if we have different implementations of this and they can talk to each other because we specified the protocol between a publisher and a subscriber, uh, that would make the, the best use of all the effort. I'm just making a completely made up example here which probably doesn't work, uh, but which might work in the future is that you use uh, the, a data store driver from the reactor framework and pipe the stream of data through some actors um, using an ACA transformation pipeline, use Rx to monitor things, and, and finally use that to drive a vertex REST API. That is the perfect um, uh, uh, interop uh, story which, which we would like to see. Um, 
John Brisbane has written a blog post on tribalism as a force for good, which discusses precisely this motivation, that we want to have a current, uh, a common uh, currency to deal in, which will unite these uh, open source projects to work together to solve this problem for everyone. Now, how can we make this work? None of us has, has really been in any, like, these huge committees, uh, so we don't have that process. Uh, I think we, we just figured out uh, a minimal process. So we want to make a, an interface, uh, so the library footprint should be minimal. Should be the smallest possible, the simplest thing that, that we can come up with. And then we need a very rigorous specification of the behavior of the methods which we specify. Uh, the specification is worth nothing if you can't test it, so the most crucial component uh, is not the interfaces itself, that's quite trivial. Uh, it's the TCK, the Technology Comp Compatibility Kit, which you can run your, uh, against your uh, implementation to verify that it actually meets the spec. And that will uh, be the, the thing which de decides whether this effort is successful in achieving interoperability or not. Uh, what we deliberately left out is um, any user-facing API. And that is very much intentional because we, we want, as I said yesterday as well, uh, to enable uh, reactive applications which are polyglot, which use different programming languages, different frameworks and toolkits and so on. Uh, you should not be forced to use only one thing. And different languages, different toolkits express um, their computations and, and everything in slightly different ways. So to allow uh, all implementations to have user-facing API, which is idiomatic for their use case, um, means that we can't specify it. So uh, we leave it up to all the implementations to define how you actually uh, write the DSL for transforming your streams. But the crucial point is that we solve, uh, we answer the question of how do I pass a stream across an async boundary? And that means we have interoperability between different implementations. So let's come finally to the meat. I told you this is the, the, the trivial part. It's just three interfaces with seven me methods. And if you know Rx, uh, you will notice that this is nearly the same thing. We have just added two things. We have on the subscription added the request more which is precisely the demand propagation, uh, which is flowing upstream. And we have on the subscriber the onSubscribe method, where the subscriber gets the subscription so that it can actually invoke the re request more method later. I'll show the, uh, the, the flow uh, in a few minutes. So this is actually quite simple. Uh, and you will notice that all methods on here are pure side effects. This is not very monady, right? This is not very functional programming-like um, because everything is side effects. The, uh, the point here is, as I said, that uh, we cannot really return anything meaningfully directly because we are talking about an asynchronous boundary. So if you go across an asynchronous boundary and you want to return something which makes sense, uh, you will have to block or synchronize or do things like that, and we want to avoid that. So the only way to do that, there are two ways to do that. Um, one is the academical way, which, which, has, which Eric Meyer has presented at ReactConf, is that uh, he made it return future in all these places, uh, which is a theoretically nice model, uh, but it forces you to allocate futures for every single thing you do. And if you want to pass a million messages per second uh, in, in your stream, allocating all these futures will just hurt. So what we're doing here is something which is basically implementing the same scheme, just in a mechanical sympathy, sympathy kind of way. Uh, so everything returns unit. Now, to go with this meet, we have a source, which is the specification. Um, and it can, it's, it's a bit longer than this. Yeah, it, it has uh, quite a few paragraphs and so on, but it can be summarized like this. Uh, on the subscriber, Everything you call, so these methods which, which we have here, um, on next, on error, on complete, um, all these methods must not block. In fact, they must not execute logic 
um, on the same thread. They all, all must dispatch to another thread. This is the async boundary I was talking about. Same thing goes for the subscription. Um, when you call request more or, or cancel, um, it must not block. And uh, the publisher basically is just there. Um, that was the, the home of this lonely method called subscribe. The publisher is just there to have an interface uh, where you can get the subscription from. Uh, it's just a factory um, for these publisher-subscriber relationships. Now, if we look at the, how does such a, a stream work, how do you hook, the, hook up the two parties? We start out with a publisher and a subscriber. Uh, the subscriber gets passed into the subscribe method of the publisher. Publisher creates a subscription and passes that into the unsubscribe method of the subscriber. This is a two-way handshake to make both parties known to each other. And then uh, the subscriber can at any time call request more on the subscription, which then will lead to the publisher or subscription, depending on your uh, implementation, to call on next on the subscriber. This is the basic flow uh, of, of method calls. So we have demand flowing right to left here, and we have data items flowing uh, left to right. So this is, uh, this is basically all. It's, it's a big project and so on, but it, it boils down to very, very minimal things. Um, I can show you uh, now in the remaining slides uh, how we have implemented this, uh, this uh, draft standard or uh, proposed um, specification, if you will, uh, in a project called ACA Streams. ACA Streams naturally use ACA actors to run things. Uh, actors are really nice because they are their own execution, engi little, uh, execution engines uh, which can just perform work whenever something gets sent to them. Uh, you can easily distribute them and supervision um, makes them resilient and so on. This is very nice. And uh, what, we, what, we, what the motivation for us was to start this whole thing uh, and to talk with people was that we want to allow um, the uh, transfer of bulk data between actors uh, in a type safe fashion, including proper back pressure handling to not blow up the mailbox. So this is exactly what ACA streams provide. We have a type safe DSL for composing streaming through actors with bounded buffering. Now, without further ado, some code. Um, for those of you who, who has seen ACA before, that's fortunate. Uh, for the other ones, <laughs> For the other ones, I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through it. Uh, an actor system is, is a container which, which uh, can, can host actors. And actors are these little independent agents which perform these tasks. And uh, in order to create an actor, you need to have an actor system in which it can live. Uh, this actor system is made implicitly available. It will be used by the steps down here. We, uh, I'll talk about the flow material, materializer later. Uh, the basic um, DSL element uh, which we have come up with is called a flow. A flow describes the kind of stream. It's, it's, like, it's like building the, the duct through which the water shall flow later. Uh, so this flow is seeded from uh, a vector. We take some text and split it on white space to get the, the list of words. And this will be the data source for our stream. Then for every word we map a function over it which calls two uppercase on it. So we have then a stream of uppercase words. And for each of these transformed words, we print them out on the console. And uh, the, the important thing to note is this returns a, a stream of, uh, of strings. Mapping that one returns a, a flow of streams. This will be a flow of streams. Calling for each on it, well, that will perform a side effect for every element but it still returns a flow. And this flow is a flow of unit. Unit is void in Scala. So it returns you one element, which does not really say anything beyond, okay, the, here is this element. And it does that when the, when the flow has finished. When the stream is completed, then you get this one element. And we consume that here in the oncomplete combinator, where uh, we get um, from, uh, we, we, you might have seen that not only on next was there, was there, there was also on error. So you can also have errors in your streams. 
uh, if there was an error, then this case will be invoked. If there was no error, then this case will be invoked. So we just shut down the system. Um, now, the next thing uh, you might have been wondering what this mat is, this flow materializer. It's a kind of uh, funny name. We have not found a better one yet. If you have suggestions, open tickets on our issue tra tracker. Um, this flow materializer takes each step which is described in this DSL and turns it into an actor. So this one will, when it executes, be one actor for, for uh, executing the, the flow itself, uh, so the, the, the source, enumerating these strings. Then the map will run inside one actor, the for each will run in one side, inside one actor, and the own complete will also run inside one actor. The beauty of this is everything is parallel. So you have properly pipelined your whole processing and, uh, and everything can run in, in parallel naturally. But the flow materializer, that's the de default one which we ship right now. The flow materializer can also be a lot smarter than that. It could also fuse operations, just like what uh, um, Brian Gertz talked about this morning. We could run uh, the, the map and for each in one actor, for example. Uh, that, that's completely up to this, to this thing, which is why we left it open. It's a strategy which you pass in, how, to, how you want your flow, well, to be materialized. That's how we arrived at the name. Then, there is one difference here to the Java 8 stream version. I told you that the for each method in that case only returned once the stream was fully processed. Um, this is not the case here. This just defines, okay, uh, I want to start from this ve vector and then I describe what I want to happen and oncomplete will actually create the actors and start the whole thing, uh, but the processing happens asynchronously. So when we fall off the end here and the main thread exits, the actor system is still active and still running and you will see the printouts. Um, so that's what system.shutdown does. This terminates the application after all, all elements have been processed. I can show you a, a little bit more involved example just quickly. Uh, the interesting feature here is uh, the group by operator. So we, we get a log file. The log file has a format where it has the, the log level in front and this is a, a regular expression extractor where we get the, um, the log level from. And the interesting part is, you don't need to understand the full syntax, the interesting part is, in this for each, we now get uh, not single elements, we get pairs of log level and a producer of a stream. Whenever a new log level is seen the first time when we go through this file, we will open a new substream. And this substream will then get all the lines with this log level as they, come, uh, as they are, are seen by the process. So what we get here is a stream of streams, so to speak. When we get such a thing, we open a new print writer for a file where we separate this log level into, and then we make a flow from this producer, and, and say for each element, we, we print it to that file, out printle, and when this stream is complete, which will happen when the, when the whole input stream is complete, we close that file. And when, when, the whole, when, when everything is complete, we also need to close the file we read from. So resource management uh, is also built in uh, with these oncomplete uh, combinators. I think they, they will be very popular. Now, um, just-in-time delivery of software means that this morning, Patrick opened the pull request um, adding a, a Java 8 uh, API um, to our ACA streams. So this is how an example would look like uh, in Java 8. And it's not actually that much different. I mean, you need to repeat some types here, but that's basically it. We have, we have a, a, a list of strings and a list of values. We create a flow from this input, which is the list from zero to five. Uh, we drop two, so strike the zero and the one. Then we take only three, so that's two, three, four. Then we map a function, which uh, looks things up in this array, transforming it. Then we filter out some things, uh, grouped, um, uh, con con uh, converts it into a stream of lists, uh, lists of size two in this case, uh, to, to demonstrate this map concat, which is a flattening operation. So um, we have the, the list of, of uh, D and E here, I think, uh, which we just return, and map concat will, will, will not emit a list of D and E in the new stream, but D and E separately, that's the flattening. 
and then we can accumulate them and, and print them and so on. So this is just, just to try out the, the API. You don't need to, to understand the whole program. The, the, the point is, with Java 8 lambdas, this becomes entirely viable. Uh, if you really want to see, there is this pull request which you will find if you go to our repository where Patrick uh, also um, included the same thing for Java 6. Uh, using, it's using the same API. That's, that's the good thing Brian uh, also so nicely explained this morning that we are able now, given the work that they have done, uh, to provide one API which works both for Java 6 and Java 8. Uh, but in Java 6, this, you, you need to have these anonymous classes everywhere. So I think we'll, we'll see a lot of Java 8 uptake due to this feature. Now, to show you that not only complete toy examples, this has also network support. Uh, we are working on file support. So if you go to the I.O. extension of Akka and ask it for the, the stream TCP part, uh, you can, this is an actor message send uh, which gets a reply. So we, we ask it to bind to some address and we get back a future uh, with the bind result. When this feature completes, it can be either a success or a failure. If it's a success, then it will contain a TCP server binding. Uh, so we can say, uh, we can print out the local address at which we are listening. And then the meat of a TCP echo server is just these four lines, nothing more. Um, what, what we get here is from the server uh, binding a connection stream, where we, one, e each element is a new incoming connection from some client. And for each of these, we, we can print out the remote address, but the main point is that we take the input stream and say produce to output stream. So we just hook up the inputs to the outputs, which makes an echo. And that's it. We just, we just need to, to start this, so we need some terminal actions, so we consume this flow. We are not interested in, in the result in this case. And this is an echo server. You can try that out. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show a link uh, or, or the name to the activator template, which contains all this code. And you can try it out and use Telnet and, and, and write things and, and see how it works. The last thing I will show is a very early sketch. I would not even call it a preview uh, of the work which is currently done in order to port Spray as Akka HTTP. And Akka HTTP will be completely based on these uh, Akka streams, um, on, on which implement reactive streams. So you, that's, that's uh, the interesting part of this interoperability story again. So when you ask for the HTTP IO extension and you send it a request channel setup, when you get that, um, that will contain a processor. A processor is a publisher and a subscriber in one. So on one end you can put data in, on the other hand data come out. Uh, so in this case you put in HTTP requests uh, and out come HTTP responses. And, and this is basically uh, taking a, a, a file from disk which is streamed. So we create a flow from the file and create a, a producer of a stream from that. And the HTTP request then contains that. And once, once you send um, the, the HTTP request, you don't even need to read all the file and memory in, uh, in order to be able to send it. You can stream it directly from disk. And that will be, will be rather efficient. There are some, some details in there which, which are not really that relevant now. So um, I can come uh, to the uh, closing remarks. What is the current state of these projects? Um, what we've published, I would call an early preview. Uh, it's, it's not a beta version or something. It's, it's really to, to get started, to get it out in the open, to get feedback. Uh, that is the main point. We have published artifacts uh, both for reactive streams in version 0.2 uh, and for the ACA streams in version 0 .3, uh, 0.3. And the APIs uh, are bound to change um, dramatically, maybe, uh, as we get feedback from, from users. Uh, but you can, you can check it out. Uh, there is an activator template. Uh, if you're not familiar with what it is, you can take a look at typesafe.com. Otherwise, uh, you can just see the, the code which is in the activator template in this GitHub repository. And the next steps are that uh, our long-term goal is that this should one day make it into some kind of future JDK version um, because we believe that in having an interoperable uh, story for um, reactive stream handling uh, will be essential um, for future applications. 
And the main point, as I said, is that uh, we want you to try it out, um, uh, to, to experiment with it, to, to bang your head against it and, and complain or give feedback or any, anything you might want. Um, there is a, a website which is backed by a, a Git repository here in this Reactive Streams GitHub organization. So you can submit pull requests both to, uh, to Reactive Streams and to the website if you find things you might want to correct. Uh, so I, I uh, invite everyone uh, to participate. Thank you very much. Uh, and, I, and I noticed that, again, I, I nearly forgot, uh, Jamie and I are writing a book on reactive design patterns, and Manning was so kind to create a special 44% uh, discount code for Philly ETE, which is P-H-E-T-E-C-F, if you want to use that. <laughs>